Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Matt Flynn. I've been with Invicro for about six months. I'm the test engineer. Uh, I'm in charge of um, getting most of our testing, both manual and automated tests, uh, ready to go and, and making sure that they're up to date and everything. Uh, our next speaker uh, is going to be talking about Core Lab and some, some of the clinical applications of, uh, of our software and the rest of those capabilities. Um, so please help me welcome our Executive Vice President for Image Analysis, Dr. Jacob Esterman. excited to be able to talk to everybody today. I'm going to be speaking a little bit about how we've started to use VivoQuant in the uh, Core Lab. So first I'll talk about what is Invicro's Core Lab, uh, just a, a brief overview, kind of how that works, um, you know, what its purpose is, and, and then why it makes sense for us to use VivoQuant there. I'll spend a, a pretty few slides on what are some of the considerations we have to take into account to enable the use of VivoQuant in the Core Lab. I, you know, I do focus most of my attentions on image processing and image analysis, so, so we'll definitely talk about some of those considerations, but then, as is appropriate for this meeting, also some of the software uh, applications uh, or considerations. And then I'll give a couple examples where we've been deploying uh, using VivoQuant already, uh, specifically in uh, morphometric MR, so a CNS application, and then also with a uh, Persist and Persist-like uh, quantitative analysis deployment for oncology applications. So the, at a high level, just to, you know, like pick, pick a gram, I guess, the, um, if, we, if we think about how, so in Vicro is the magnifying glass logo, and then there's typically going to be some clinical CRO associated with the project, and those two groups will both be interacting with a, a, a sponsor, typically a pharmaceutical company, and working together to develop a uh, protocol, a plan, how basically this multi-center trial is going to run. Information will actually come from all three of those sources, typically to uh, the little kind of Clara Barton icon, uh, which is the different imaging centers or sites and centers. From there, data will flow back, often clinical data, let's say to the clinical CRO, but to, to, to us in the core lab, we'll be receiving mostly uh, imaging data and any associated meta information that we need to correspond with that imaging data. Some sort of, you know, on the next slide we'll dive much more detail into that bullet, but uh, information will be passed back to the sponsor and, and often ultimately goes to the FDA, which is a highly relevant to the discussion later in the slides when we think about what are some of the considerations for use of a software in that environment. Um, so if we zoom in on this little area where we have data coming from mul multiple locations back into Invicro, in this case, the Invicro's core lab, uh, there are several pieces to that chain. Uh, data will be used, uh, uploaded from the imaging site or imaging center, go into, can I use, will this okay, work? That works okay. Uh, flow into a some sort of standardization and image QC this is where query, essentially everything's, the, da the data are looked at very closely to make sure all the information is accurate, the meta information, that the image data look reasonable, that they will be well supported by whatever we want to do with them, typically quantitative analysis or radiolo uh, radiologist read. They'll then be enrolled into the repository. In this case, we know that, that all of these functions are built on uh, the IPAX as a common software platform. That's how we're doing all of this work. That's sort of the bedrock on which we build everything. Finally, what we're really going to focus on here is going to be this either a read piece and or a quantification piece in which we're going to need to pull that data down, do some kind of processing, generate some sort of numerical output that we care about, and then feed it back into the repository where ultimately a group such as data management in the core lab uh, can, can pull that data and, and um, get it back to the sponsor. Uh, 
So this is a, you know, we're going to be focusing really on this chain here, but I wanted to, to impress a little bit upon just folks about how this is a, a very large process. I, I think our core lab in, in New Haven, which is where it's based, our New Haven clinical facility, we have around 80 people uh, focused on, on the, the, in particular the chain I showed on the previous slide. So, you know, working with coordinating, generating the protocols, coordinating with the centers, bringing that data in, performing that QC and queries through the image processing and, and the reporting, and then uh, just sort of all overseen by a project management team. So it's, it's a, a very large operation, and we're really going to be focusing on a, a smaller piece of that, but it always, that smaller piece always has to be viewed in the context of that, those larger, uh, often multi-year trials. So if we focus now a little bit, we're going to, we're going to say, all right, we've gotten our, we figured out how we're going to acquire the data. We've set up all the sites to do so, and they're generating the data, and we're pulling it into our system. So, and we've checked it all, so we know to a certain extent that it should be ready to go. Now we want to feed it into uh, our image processing pipeline. What are some of the requirements of both the software and, and the analysis uh, within that, that coil environment so that we can feed it through the image analysis pipeline, pull the, the data that we want back out, integrate it into the overall system architecture, and ultimately enable it to be reported? So some of these, very nice language, uh, Gabe, oh, Gabe, I think, originally put together these slides. Um, study endpoint accuracy leads to accurate and reliable deliverables. Basically, we want the tool to work. Um, the analysis needs to be correct. We need to get the right numbers out. So that's that's really you know pretty pretty critical deliverable. Um, so first, get the right numbers. Second, again, we have so some of these studies can easily have hundreds, if not sometimes low thousands, numbers of subjects imaged at sites across the world. Uh, different scanner models, uh, there's pathology involved, you've got multiple time points. So we do as much as, as we can on the, f through the process of site setup and, and data QC to ensure that we have standardized data, but even so there's going to be some variability there. So it's pretty important that you have a tool that's robust, that's going to be able to take data from, you know, given all those different variables and still be able, in the vast majority of cases, to provide you with meaningful information on, on the other end. Sometimes, it, sometimes it's impossible and you have to throw those data away, but we do a lot to try to minimize how much data we lose because it, it's all very valuable. Uh, the third critical piece is compliance. Um, we should be able to, to, whenever a data set comes in, and again, we're, we're focused on this image processing chain, but it's true for that whole process, we need to know from the time that subject walks in the door to the time the data are ultimately uh, transmitted to the, the sponsor or the FDA, you know, what was done with that data set. And, and that includes all the image processing. And, and in a lot of ways, many of the image processing steps are a little more black box than, than some of the other maybe steps along the chain. So we need to be especially diligent about having a record of what's happening there. <laughs> some other items, nice to have, but that just means that People are going to want them to. Uh, operational efficiency, basically, it's great if it works and it works all the time, but if it takes a single user 87 steps per data set or that changes from data set to data set, that's going to be really challenging to practically deploy. Similarly, if there are uh, overly complex steps or confusing layouts or designs, uh, users, if, if there are human interaction steps, which which does happen, humans make we're really good at making mistakes, and uh, if if you provide users that opportunity, they, they will take it. Uh, there are, uh, you know, we do want to know, and we spent a lot of time with this. Given it, it's one of the nice things, given the amount of data we're often working with in the core lab, that we can pull in real time performance metrics to understand how a tool is performing, either in terms of its numerical performance, but just also how well does it fit into a workflow. Uh, we want, again, user-friendly. These are all kind of tied together. And then easily extendable. That's an important one and often a challenging one. The core lab analyses we're often trying to distill into maybe the most 
core of the image processing that we do. If we think about in the preclinical space, we'll often have very broad analysis applications. We're trying new things all the time. Let's, you know, we're, we're of course, you know, using good uh, principles in that application, but it's often shorter time scale, something new. We're going to try this out. Core Lab tend to be much more. Uh, mature and well understood workflows, but at the same time, no, we all know no two studies are alike. So being able to both support that uh, robust infrastructure while also being flexible enough to accommodate different studies is, is something we think about a lot. Any, any questions so far before I dive into a couple examples? These are the things that we've tried to consider as we we put this in place. Uh, then I'll dive into just a couple specific examples. I can't see a time anywhere. Oh, I have tons of time. Okay. So morphological uh, uh, MRI. I'll start with a little bit of, of our approach here from an analysis standpoint. Uh, volumetric segmentation in, in the brain is there are multiple ways to skin this cat. Um, we've I think folks here maybe who have attended this meeting previously or just use VivoPon are familiar with, we, we're pretty comfortable with a multi-atlas segmentation approach. It's it's one, it's a tool we use quite a bit also for thinking preclinically, uh, through clinically. It's really nice. We use it in whole body applications. You know, we do a lot of dosimetry analysis. We use it to automatically segment uh, whole body regions from mouse through human, but also more focused analysis. We've done it in the gastrocnemius muscle in, in mice, but we also use the technique in brain volumetrics. It's a well-established technique there. It's, it's uh, and in a lot of ways was why this technique was developed. Um, at a high level, we have, let's say an input T1 weighted 3D volumetric data set. We're gonna go through a pre-processing step of which Gabe hit on a couple of the, uh, the functions in place for that and then a, a multi-atlas segmentation. Uh, on the right, you can see some example ROIs. So that pre-processing, again, this comes down to that the importance of that data harmonization. So, you know, I think Gabe showed the images at the top. Part of that, that was collaboration between core lab analysis and, and software to say, hey, these are, these are uh, pieces of the pipeline that we use to pre-process data that really improve our robustness. Uh, can we work together to integrate them natively into the VivoQuant? So on the, you can see that the noising example on the right, you can top right. You can see a, uh, you know, the impact of of bias field correction, which is pretty dramatic for this case. Actually, there are this is this is an important one as a function of you learn of scanner model. There are some scanners that are pretty consistently rough in the uh, bias field sense, and this level of bias will throw off registration algorithms when you're looking for changes on the order of small percentages or even fractions of a percent in volume change for complex regions. Follow that up with uh, in a, a pretty straightforward intensity standardization step, uh, anterior, posterior, commissure alignment, uh, uh, and a cropping step so that we get very, you know, these steps, I, I would say on 90% of data sets, excluding one or more of these steps probably wouldn't impact our outcome. But this is all about trying to do everything we can to make sure that when we get to this point, the data are going to get pushed through that algorithm and, and give us a proper answer. Part of that comes down to the QC we'll talk about a little bit because for volumetrics in particular, uh, manual adjustments are very challenging uh, to, to make sure that you have consistent performance within and between observers over time when you're looking for such small changes in such complex regions. Anything we can do to essentially avoid, both from a time and performance standpoint, having to make those manual adjustments we, we try to do. From there, this is a, a very sort of high-level car cartoonish example of how a, the, the multi-atlas segmentation approach works generally. You have some uh, pre-existing reference library with uh, a segmented regions, whichever regions you're really interested in. This is the, the most time-consuming step if you have to regenerate it for a new study. Uh, a target data set comes in following pre-processing. There's a series of, of it's sort of a multi-resolution registration framework, affine uh, followed by nonlinear registration. We do some mm, post-processing of all of those registered data to select certain data sets 
and then uh, there's a variety of different label fusion approaches that you, that can be used to ultimately land on a final um, first a probable sort of a probabilistic distribution of a particular region of interest, and finally collapsing that to a determined ROI. Another picture of the example output that I think I'll just uh, skip over. We did do so. If we think about uh, analysis, sort of proof of principle first, uh, that was something that we did here. This is actually what was presented this year at the AIC just as a, again, you know, this is something where we like this tool. We feel it works well. There are lots of, of different tools for segmenting brain volumes, but, you know, we, we need to do our homework to make sure ours is working well. We snagged about 125 subjects from the ADNI cohort, analyzed them longitudinally, looked at uh, atrophy rates as the slope of a linear fit to all the volumes because uh, different subjects had different number of scans, looked at a percent change per year from baseline, and then for completeness compared our results to FreeSurfer, which is on the left um, with versus the multi-atlas segmentation deployment with the left and right hippocampal regions separately for normals, late MCI, or, um, MCI and AD subjects just to try to understand you know, are we sensitive? How, how does it compare to, to admittedly a well-established tool that, um, you know, we thought about using, but for a lot of purposes around uh, validation, automation, control of source code, um, it made a lot of sense to, to deploy our own tool for this application. So once we have some understanding that this, this approach is working, it's ready to go, we, you know, have a, a, a a, a pipeline here. Actually, this is uh, a combined uh, little flow chart that shows our volumetric approach. One of the things that we like about this approach as well is that we can use an almost common pre-processing pipeline. There are a couple other steps in here to support uh, cortical thickness, and we are we are, as you've probably noticed from um, Gabe's talk, you know we we're heavy users of of, of ants and, and those tools. So now we need to think about kind of two phases. One, if we have this pipeline, first, how can we get it into VivoQuant? Because it, if it's in the VivoQuant, we can use it uh, for a whole variety of applications, exploratory studies that maybe don't have the sort of overhead of, of a core lab deployment. Once it's there, great, but then we also need to think about how does that fit into that overall core lab piece that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this is this is sort of how we start thinking about that. There are there are words that you'll see on here that we don't you know put normally on nice polished slides like fail and crash. Those never came up, so we didn't really even have to worry about them. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know these were just some of the notes that we started with with trying to think about how are we going to take what is already we've put so much energy into the analysis pipeline, but now how does it fit into that broader? Uh, architecture of, of the core lab. <clears throat> so how this ultimately ends up looking when we take take those scribbles on a whiteboard and turn them into something that's scribbles on a PowerPoint slide. Um, you know we have the those pre-processing and MAS those are sort of the big bins. There's QC and if needed manual intervention that happens after that step before it's fed into the multi atlas segmentation. So this quality control is pretty critical at, at both phases to ensure that uh, that we have proper data that makes sense. In some cases, we often need to have, and these are things that I think come in when you're in those later phase environments that maybe we don't don't need to have quite as always. We always QC data, of course, preclinically, but it's maybe not quite as formal formalized in the sense of having a, a full second QC that's recorded. Uh, if there's disagreement between two QC observers, having an adjudicator, you know, these sorts of um, needs that all come in when we're in this much more regulated environment. So this all fits into that image processing piece, which is already, even before we get to the QC on the image processing, the data are assessed by quality by the um, image coordination team in the core lab. They are pushed by the image coordinator to the IPACs to kick off this chain. And then, then when, when we have that data, it's all stored back uh, into the, uh, the IPACs from where the data management team who, who controls the, 
the data once it comes out of the image processing as well as bringing in lots of other associated data can combine them and prepare a highly specified report for further distribution. And all of this work is then further supported by the software IT teams as well as compliance and regulatory teams. So this just goes to that point of how we take that image processing workflow and integrate it into the larger uh, scheme. So these are now just a few screenshots to kind of show what that looks like, can look like in practice. I think this might have a little uh, animation too. So the data come from center, they go through the QC, they're put on the IPACs, and then you see we have, and, and actually we're, we use, uh, we're using here, kind of getting into the, the nitty gritty a little bit, but this pre-processing and automated, um, because we can have data coming from dozens of, of imaging centers simultaneously. So there's working again very closely with the software team. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to Gabe and his VivoQuant team, as well as Eli and the IPAX team for putting in place all these different mechanisms where we can have data come in, hit the IPAX, go into a processing queue, pre-processing is kicked off, there's an automated notification via, in our case, Slack, to someone who can perform QC, pop it back in the queue, volume estimation occurs, Slack notification, second QC, all of these steps are tracked and trailed, there's a log that can be generated and reviewed at any given time so that you can track both what's being done to the image and who's in any way uh, interacting with that data set. Other pieces that, that come into play are, um, you know, this is a nice high level overview of that sort of trail, but if we look a little more closely, you can see here an example whole brain segmentation, but then the sort of form that uh, is put into the VivoQuant for a reviewer to use. It's uh, an electronic case report form. We use these uh, across the board, and if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a slide uh, looking at how radiology readers can use this within the VivoQuant similarly, but we can define forms for a study uh, that the reviewer is able to confirm essentially that any process has done what it, what it should and then submit that form so we have a record with a digital signature that verifies both that the performance was adequate and that someone has reviewed that performance to, to ensure so. Um, just another sort of example of an interface with, with the VivoQuant where you're having sort of, we often have, uh, it's all VivoScript driven, so here we have a multi-atlas segmentation, ROI QC1. It will walk the user through the assessment of certain regions and then essentially walk them through submitting those final regions to the IPACs so that the quantitative metrics can be extracted and made available to the data management team. So that's the volumetric analysis just briefly. So that's something we're using actively in the core lab. Another area that we're starting uh, also actively uh, using the VivoQuant in the core lab is, is with oncology uh, analysis. So I think folks here are probably primarily familiar with Persist. Um, it's a it's sort of analogous to Reese's criteria. It's really developed for FDG and solid tumors. Um, originally from a 2009 publication updated very nicely actually in a paper called Practical Persis, a simplified guide to pet response criteria in solid tumors where groups had actually tried to use it in this sort of environment and realized where there was a lot of ambiguity in the initial deployment and made some comments there. So because it's well known and it's it, it's actually quite amenable to quantitative core lab type analyses, we, we're, this is one uh, tool that we use as a basis for some of our oncology studies as a complement really to the typical quantitative uh, qualitative radiologist read. So the idea being if we have a longitudinal study, especially if it's F18, FDG, can be used for other tracers with some modifications. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get that qualitative read that I think many groups are most comfortable with and then we can pair it with a quantitative analysis that combines typically some sort of SUV or S lean, SUV lean body mass based measures potentially with some other more novel or newer uh, out outcome. Again, we have the same of, of, of high-level workflow 
where we have a data QC and pre-processing steps, which include technical QC, pre-processing, a scientific quality control, some form of lesion segmentation, followed by a radiologist ROI review and extraction of the measures that we want to enable ipac based reporting. Again here, now we just have a different sort of flavor of algorithm schematic that we need to enable this sort of robust approach. This one I won't walk through in detail, but I'll just say we tailored this to, if we think back to that robustness and accuracy argument, we tailored this analysis to be uh, essentially to segment lesions, allowing a lot of false positives because a radiologist will come in and go through each candidate lesion and either accept it as a, a lesion or reject it with some criteria. Much more straightforward for a radiologist to, to reject a false positive lesion by saying this is the bladder than it is to say then, then if a, a lesion was missed to then go back and somehow figure out how to manually segment that lesion so that its parameters are in concordance with the automated segmentation routine. Here's what's a, just a couple screenshots for what that can look like where we have again a series of vivo scripts that are driving this workflow tied together with an ipac based workflow for navigating users through the steps. So we can have segmentation where you have um, candidate regions that are automatically identified and then an ROI review by a radiologist who can go through each lesion and uh, either accept that as a focal lesion or reject as some sort of uh, with some sort of criteria. And then as well, now using the VivoQuant, this is a busy slide, I won't walk through all of it, but just showing there's also a radiologist read functionality where radiologists can come in, use electronic case report forms within the VivoQuant to make more of a traditional read that can be uploaded to the IPACs in um, collaboration with that quantitative data. I have one slide on these. Should I, yeah, should I go through two minutes? Okay. Just, just a little more on how, how that workflow can, can work. So create and manage a case report form from the IPACs, which we know is tightly tied to the VivoQuant. Do that with the, the, the YAML editor. It can be previewed. Um, this is more in terms of how those data points exist on the IPACs. And then we can have those pre-existing forms. Data set comes in. It's assigned to a remote reader or viewer. They perform the read or the QC in the, in the VivoQuant. They're making their assessment using those very nice new hanging protocols, which we all just saw. Fill in the ECRF there. And then transmit that back to the IPAC. So this is a from which you know we can make summary reports at the individual subject or multi-subject level. So this is a, all tied in. It's a little more of the qualitative traditional read component. Uh, contrasted against uh, the quantitative component that we're using for so many PET and MR trials now. So these are the summaries. I, I hit on these points quite a bit. I, I do want to, I didn't have an acknowledgement slide here, but uh, oh, as I said, I want to acknowledge the, especially the software team here as well as the core lab team in New Haven who have really been um, working together to, to make this a reality that it is being used now. So, thank you. Questions? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, sure. So the question was that if we have, uh, if there are multimodal data uh, for IMB submission or other submission to the FDA that require a specified format such as send for reporting, are we able to support that? Yes, we, we support a variety of reporting schema uh, and actually there are a couple people here from the data management team who probably in a break could answer your question in even uh, some more detail. Send is one that we support a lot of INDs as well. So I think it would just be, it's, it's likely a matter of we'll take the data from the VivoQuant, put it on the IPACs, and then from the IPACs we can 
generate a custom report in the desired format, whether send or maybe see this, to to support uh, whatever the submission need is. Yes. Any other questions? Oh. Okay, because there's also the question section, so I was just not sure if that was different. <laughs> I don't know if Bernie is, but maybe we should send him something. Or... Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much.